They come silently out of the dark, like creatures from a half-forgotten dream. Nearly a quarter of all mammals are bats. There are almost a thousand species of them. They're crucial to the world's ecology and desperately endangered. They've long been victims of popular myth and superstition. There are probably more misconceptions about bats than any other animal. For the record, they're not aggressive, they're not blind, and they certainly don't get entangled in long hair. They're vitally important in many aspects of life on Earth, though the details of their role have only recently become apparent. This new knowledge is the work of a handful of dedicated scientists. Merlin Tuttle has observed more kinds of bats in more places than anyone else. He founded Bat Conservation International, an organization which encourages worldwide understanding. In the course of his travels, he makes it his business to try to convince people that bats are useful animals and not the nightmare creatures of popular myth. Merlin Tuttle is the ideal guide on a series of expeditions to some of the world's most important and spectacular sites, revealing the extraordinary diversity of the secret world of bats. live on every continent except Antarctica. There are over a hundred species in North America alone. Bracken Cave in Texas contains the single largest colony of bats in the world, between 20 and 40 million Mexican free tails. It's the densest population anywhere of any warm-blooded animal. The bats come to Bracken Cave during the summer to give birth and to raise their young. Each square meter of cave wall is covered by as many as 4,000 tiny bat pups, pink and hairless. The adults and pups roost separately, forming pink and brown patches on the walls. Females give birth to only one baby a year. Each mother, using only hearing and smell, can find her single offspring in total darkness in a cave 200 meters long. The newborn young are large, about a third of adult size, and they develop quickly. Within three or four weeks, they're exercising their wings. The floor of the cave is a seething mass of carnivorous beetles. Their first attempt at flight is crucial. Young bats have to leap off into the air in complete darkness, never having flown before, and avoid colliding with other bats. A mistake now is usually fatal. The beetles and their larvae make short work of a young bat, and within minutes, only a few bones remain. About 70% of the world's bats eat insects. They're by far the most important natural controllers of night-flying pests. One bat can eat between 500 and 1,000 in an hour. The occupants of Bracken Cave eat over 250 tons of insects each evening as they fly over the surrounding farmland. The California leaf-nosed bat is a highly specialized hunter. It can hear the footsteps of a cricket. In the deserts of the American Southwest, bats have an essential part in maintaining the fragile ecosystem. Many familiar desert plants are dependent on bats for their survival. 
During the day, the flowers of the agave feed hummingbirds and insects, which nevertheless play only a small role in pollinating the plant. By day, the flowers are inactive. They release pollen and secrete nectar only after nightfall. This rich source of energy attracts the bats. As each lesser long-nosed bat probes the flowers for food, showers of pollen cover its face and body. The bats pollinate hundreds of flowers in a single evening. Many cactus plants also depend on bats for pollination. Their flowers open after sundown, ready for the nocturnal visitors. When the flowers of the organ pipe cactus open, small groups of bats move from one to the next, taking turns to feed. The familiar saguaro is also pollinated by bats. Its blossoms don't open until midnight, when the flowers of other cacti nearby have yielded up their nectar and been pollinated, so there's no competition between them. The muzzle of a long-nosed bat is perfectly shaped to fit deep inside the cactus blossom, like a key into a lock. As the bats dip their heads to reach the nectar, the saguaro flowers are pollinated. When they return to the roost, their faces are covered with pollen that hasn't rubbed off in the flowers. They lick it off as a valuable source of protein. Without the bats, many of the desert's most important plants could die out, threatening the entire ecosystem. It's not just in this harsh environment that the presence of bats is essential. In tropical rainforests, such as those in French Guyana, they also have a crucial role to play. Rainforests are the home of more than 90% of all terrestrial plant and animal species. The fine balance that exists between them took millions of years to evolve, but can be destroyed in a single afternoon. Once an area has been felled, its regeneration will take many years. The destruction of another area of rainforest is a familiar image, an environmental cliché. But devastation like this can regenerate itself, given the opportunity. The work of scientists like Dr. Scott Morey, a leading rainforest specialist, has revealed the immense importance of bats in this process. Merlin, bats are vital to the re-establishment of tropical rainforest after large-scale disturbance. Two and a half years ago, we came here, and the only plants in this field were plants whose seeds were brought in by bats. Later on, even today, we can see that the majority of the plants here are bat-dispersed plants. It's important to remember that the conditions for other kinds of plants to come in are first established by these bat-dispersed plants. It's only then that plants that are dispersed by birds, and later on, plants that are dispersed by other mammals, such as primates, can become established. We must remember that any conservation program in the tropics must give high priority to the conservation of bats. Because if we take bats out of this ecosystem, we cannot have normal regeneration of tropical rainforests. 
Merlin, look. Here we have three different, very excellent examples of bat dispersed plants. Here's the classic, a cecropia. Here's a visme in the background. And here's a selenum in fruit. Look at this selenum. It has a very classic kind of bat fruit. Let's take a look at this fruit. We'll open it up. And you can see all of these very small seeds on the inside. The bats will come in here, and they actually know which plants are going to have ripe fruit on any given night. They'll come in here, swallow the whole fruit, carry that fruit away, and digest it within, and, and pass these seeds out within 20 minutes. Right. I think this is one yeah. of the most important things that we have to remember is that bats pass the, the seeds out relatively rapidly. And in flight. And in flight. And this is one of the reasons that they're so important in getting those seeds into large-scale disturbance areas. The second species of Solanum holds its ripening fruits vertically, making life easier for the bats. The fruits of the Cecropia hang down in bunches. The bats come to feed on the fleshy fingers packed with seeds. Birds also eat the fruits, but it's mainly bats that carry the seeds into clearings. The seed-laden fruits of many plants have evolved specifically to be eaten by bats. The piper has fruits that stand vertically along its stems, while the leaves hang down, enabling the bats to feed in flight. It's been estimated that a single Corollia bat can disperse up to 60,000 seeds in a single night. A female Corollia bat has to continue feeding even though she's nursing a baby. The youngster, only a few days old, clings onto its mother with its feet and thumbs as she flies. She continues feeding as normal, even though she's carrying a burden of almost half her own weight. The male has no such encumbrance. She eats the piper like corn on the cob and discards the tough stalk. The undigested seeds pass through her body within minutes and are scattered as she flies over the open patches of land. Two or three years after it was cleared, the scars on the face of the forest are already beginning to disappear, the start of a healing process begun by fruit-eating bats. Because their vital role is so little known, bats continue to be exterminated throughout the world. A B-52 bomber thunders into the air as it leaves the tiny island of Guam. There's been an American military presence here since the First World War. The forests on Guam were originally the habitat of three species of bats, but two of them are now extinct. The surviving Marianas fruit bat has declined in number from many thousands to between four and five hundred, and is now listed as an endangered species. Forty percent of the island's plants rely on bats either for pollination or seed dispersal. The bats feed on fruits and flowers, in this case the flowers of a liana. As it feeds, the bat pollinates the plant. The principal reason for the catastrophic decline in their numbers is hunting for food. These bats were illegally killed on neighboring islands and smuggled in to be eaten on Guam, where they're a popular delicacy. The holes in the wings show the bats were killed by shotgun pellets. The shotgun is a serious threat to the ecology of the whole island. Because of it, many species of plants have lost their principal pollinator or seed disperser. Today, tons of fruit and fleshy flowers go uneaten each night. As they decay, they provide food for an exploding population of fruit flies.
During a recent trip to Guam, Merlin Tuttle investigated the damage with a local biologist. Fruit flies now breed in such enormous numbers that they seriously threaten commercial fruit growing on the island. The last colony of bats now lives within the safety of the airbase, right at the end of the runway, where it's carefully protected. With luck, the Marianas fruit bat will be saved from extinction, but bats are seriously threatened throughout the world. The effort to save these gentle and essential animals must overcome centuries of human ignorance and greed. Here in Southeast Asia, bats face probably their biggest threat from man. Ironically, the old Chinese temples are covered in bat motifs. They're considered a symbol of good health and prosperity. As dusk falls over the Buddhist monastery of Khao Chong Pran in Thailand, millions of bats stream out of their daytime roost to spread out over the surrounding forests and farmland. Until recently, this was quite a common sight throughout the region, but human disturbance of the caves in which the bats roost has caused a massive decline in their numbers. Fortunately for the bats, the area is owned by the local monastery and it's been protected since 1980. Since then, the number of bats has steadily increased. There are now over six million of them under the watchful eye of a warden. Without this intervention, the colony would have been lost. Most of the half dozen species that roost in the cave eat insects, devouring about 18 million kilos of them each year. They're essential to maintaining the balance of the local ecosystem. The rest are fruit eaters and a key factor in the commercial fruit trade of Southeast Asia. Throughout the world's tropical markets, about 70% of commercial fruits come from plants that in the wild rely on bats for pollination or seed dispersal. They include guavas, peaches, avocados, bananas, mangoes, and plantain. Commercially, the most important fruit of Southeast Asia is the durian, which adds $120 million a year to local economies. The flowers of the durian begin to open as the sun goes down. As night falls, they produce nectar and pollen, ready for the arrival of the bats. The dawn bat is the main pollinator of the durian. As it feeds on the nectar, it ensures that the plant will bear fruit this season. The loss of the bats poses a serious problem for the future of the durian industry. Birds don't have a chance to pollinate the flowers, and most insects are far too small. Within hours of opening, the petals begin to fall. If the flowers have not been visited by a bat, they'll remain unfertilized and there'll be no fruit. Wild bananas also rely on bats. Although commercially grown bananas don't require pollination, 
wild stocks must be maintained in order to provide the fresh genetic strains needed to keep cultivated varieties healthy. The bat's face shows just how effective it is at spreading the pollen. At daybreak, there's little outward evidence of the bat's activities, but the flowers have been pollinated and a new crop of fruit is developing. By now, the bats are already pouring back into the safety of their cave. Fewer of them will return than left last evening. Although they're protected within the cave, in the surrounding countryside, there are poachers with nets. Once the bat's feet and wings become entangled, it has little chance of escape. Throughout Southeast Asia, many thousands of bats are netted each night. The meagre flesh on their bones is in big demand. Some people even consider it to be an aphrodisiac. Many species of bats are endangered because of indiscriminate hunting. For some of them, it's already too late. They're extinct. Bats are worth far more alive than dead. Among their many valuable contributions, they produce excellent fertilizer. Once a week, the monks permit local villagers to enter certain parts of the cave where the ceiling is very high and the bats are least likely to be disturbed. Under the watchful eyes of the Buddhas, they venture deep into the cave system. The people come to collect the bats' droppings, which fall to the floor of the cave in a steady shower. It's a very valuable fertilizer. The six million bats in the cave provide an income of almost $100,000 a year for the monastery. The wages of the warden who protects the cave are well spent. As the number of bats continues to rise, so does the amount of guano, which in turn increases the income for the monastery. However, there is another product of the bat cave which is potentially even more valuable. Countless thousands of unique organisms, from fish and insects to bacteria and fungi, live on bat droppings. One small spoonful contains as many as a thousand species of bacteria, some of which may be used to solve human problems. Studies by microbiologists have already found organisms that could help to detoxify industrial waste, improve detergents, or even help in the production of antibiotics. In Australia, as in French Guiana, bats are crucial to the survival of the forests. The realization may have come in the nick of time. The grey-headed and black flying foxes in New South Wales are reduced to a tenth of their former numbers. The reason for the decline is simple. They were shot, burnt with flamethrowers, and dynamited to the verge of extinction by local farmers who blamed them for damaging commercial fruit crops. Bats normally eat only worthless, overripe fruit. Birds do much more damage, but prejudice against bats led to the massacre. Today, the flying foxes of New South Wales are legally protected. The Kuringai Bat Committee is a group of women who meet regularly to compare notes about the orphaned and abandoned youngsters in their care. This is better. She's great. No, 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 no. You've had your turn. It's Adam's turn now. He hasn't had a turn and he hasn't had a blush. Over here. Look, she's dying to have a bit of that. No, she's really... Oh, really? Really bad. 
Yeah, and um, Max's are only the um, little ones, you know, they sort of, it comes out about that far. No, this really yeah. collapsed. There is apple. Oh, there is apple. There is a piece of apple. No, Max, you're not you coming on, Mummy. Max, Mummy says no, one at a time, please. One at a time, please. Foot don't come down. That's and it just won't come down. Oh, I know you have to lost it. There you, you go. Might have you might have Right. Nothing on the when they're healthy and full grown, these flying foxes will be released back to the wild. You know, you know I don't think it's the apple itself. I don't think it's the taste of the apple. The apple Australians are learning to appreciate bats. Visitors to the Kooringai Reserve meet them at close quarters to discover how gentle and intelligent they are. They begin to understand why some scientists think flying foxes are primates related to monkeys, apes, and humans. People gather at dusk to watch the bats leave their roosts for the feeding trees. On their way, they pass over some familiar landmarks. At the Sydney Opera House, it's the first night of the season. Bats may travel a long way to find food. Here, as elsewhere, they play an important part in pollinating valuable plants and dispersing their seeds, including trees such as ironwood. Without the bats, the timber industry would be in trouble. Other plants, like bottle brush, rely on bats for pollination. The real importance of bats worldwide is not economic, but ecological. In East Africa, the baobab tree is a familiar part of the landscape and the key to the conservation of a large number of animals. So many, in fact, that it's known as the tree of life. Its flowers are pollinated by bats. They open after sunset to await their nocturnal visitors. Sweet nectar at the base of each large white petal is the incentive for the bats to visit the flowers. A female epauletted bat lands on the flower to feed. As she moves from one nectary to the next, her underside rubs against the mass of anthers hanging below and she carries the pollen from flower to flower. In another tree nearby, a male is performing his courtship display but the female continues to feed. Eventually she approaches, indicating that she accepts him as a mate. Finally, they fly off together. A rosetta bat feeding on figs is another important seed disperser. The seeds will soon be scattered over a large area.
The caves along the coast of Kenya were once important roosts, but many of them are now threatened by people who disturb and even intentionally kill the sleeping bats. Dr. Tuttle visits the caves only rarely to avoid disturbing the bats. He spends more of his time persuading local people that bats are harmless, even beneficial, and should be left in peace. A strong practical argument in their favor is that they disperse the seeds of the neem tree, whose leaves are well known along the Kenya coast as an insect repellent. A few branches placed on a buffet keep the flies away and the tourists happy. Bats have a brighter future in the city of Austin in Texas. Beneath the Congress Avenue bridge is the daytime roost of about a million Mexican free tail bats. Only a few years ago, people were petitioning city officials to get rid of them. But through the efforts of Bat Conservation International, public opinion gradually changed. Now the bats are a tourist attraction. Crowds of people gather on summer evenings to watch them emerge. Between them, they eat about 10 tons of insects every night, controlling pests throughout the area. The people of Austin are a good example of the way in which bats and people can be reconciled. There are almost a thousand species of bats worldwide, many of them familiar but overlooked as just another bat. Merlin Tuttle finds this enormous variety endlessly fascinating. Accompanied by Bert Granches, a young bat enthusiast, he finds the deserts of West Texas a rich hunting ground. Each species of bat makes its own unique ultrasonic sounds too high for humans to hear. With electronic help, it's possible to identify their voices without ever seeing them. Just lift it up about six or eight inches. Okay. Yeah, A mist net strung low over the water is the easiest way to catch bats. The mesh of the net is so fine that by the time they detect it, it's too late. Hey, it's in the net. Tuttle releases them from the net immediately to minimize the stress of being caught. Looks like we got a free tail here. So why do they call them free tails? Well, they call them free tails because, unlike most bats, they have a little bare tail like a mouse. <laughs> See the membrane here? Most bats have a membrane that comes all the way to the end of the tail. Oh, this is a big free tail bat. This is several times larger than the Mexican free-tailed bat that we just caught. In fact, these are quite rarely seen. There are eight or nine species of bat feeding or drinking in this small area. Hey, Bert, we got a ghost-faced bat here. See, here he has these really strange eyes that appear to be right back in his ears. 
and that's part of a very sophisticated navigation system that this bat has. There's no other bat in the United States that looks quite like him. The bat's sonar system, evolved over millions of years, is far more accurate than any yet developed by science. The faces of different species of bats show the variety of ways in which they use their hearing in an effective echolocation system. A spectacular demonstration of sonar detection is found in the tropical forests of Central and South America. A fish-eating species lives here whose echolocation is so well developed that it can detect an object as fine as a human hair protruding a mere millimeter above the water's surface. Here, its sonic pulses have been slowed down 60 times to make them audible. Once it's detected a fish, the bat homes in, dragging its flattened, razor-sharp claws through the water to scoop up its prey. It rarely misses. Other species of carnivorous bats live in the same area. Crotopterus, which is rarely seen, has a wingspan of over 60 centimeters. It's an efficient predator that catches a wide variety of small animals. Not all bats hunt for a living. Glossophaga hangs from flowers as it feeds, sipping nectar with a tongue as long as its body. The stamp flower makes it pay for its meal. As it feeds, the bat's back rubs against the flower's anthers, which have clearly evolved for just this function. The bat unwittingly carries the pollen on its back from flower to flower. The charm and usefulness of pollinating bats is undermined by the ominous reputation of the vampires. But even they have hidden virtues. The rainforests of Central America are home to over a hundred species of bats. There are few caves, so many species roost in hollow trees. Dr. Merlin Tuttle carefully checks the interior for venomous snakes before venturing inside. Several species of bats have taken up residence in the tree. One is Glossophaga, the nectar feeder. Nearby hang one or two corollia bats, fruit eaters and seed dispersers. In one corner, there's a vampire bat, a shy species that's been responsible for much of the general public's prejudice. It feeds exclusively on the warm blood of other mammals and birds, especially domestic animals. A chicken settles down to roost in a low tree. The bat silently lands nearby and stealthily creeps along the branch.
Heat detectors around its nose tell it where the blood vessels are closest to the surface. Licking the skin softens it while the chicken continues to sleep. With one small bite, the bat settles down to feed. A chemical in its saliva, which keeps the blood flowing freely, is a more effective anticoagulant than any currently being used for heart patients. Researchers are trying to isolate and synthesize it. The vampire bat may prove to be of considerable value for this reason alone. Vampires are a rare exception, but they've tainted public opinion about bats in general. There are plenty of endearing species to restore the balance in the bat's favour. Clustered beneath a leaf in a Costa Rican forest huddles a group of tiny white tent-making bats. They chew along the mid-rib of a heliconia leaf so that the two halves hang down, making a very effective shelter from the frequent rains. These thumb-sized, fruit-eating bats will use a tent for several weeks before making a new one elsewhere. The adults are pure white with yellow nose and ears. The young are grey. One of them is being pestered by a mosquito. When one starts to struggle, the whole group is disturbed and begins to shuffle around trying to avoid the insect. In tropical regions, bats are active throughout the year, but those that live in temperate zones have to hibernate through the winter, which makes them harder to protect. The bats return each autumn to Hubbard's cave in Tennessee, where they stay dormant for as long as six months. They're protected from human disturbance by an enormous steel grill weighing 120 tons. The bats can come and go through the grill. The public is allowed into the cave during the summer, but in winter, no one may enter, except once every two or three years when scientists check on the bats. Hubbard's Cave is one of the three largest bat hibernating sites known in the world. Seven or eight species spend the winter here. Thousands of endangered grey bats encrust the ceiling, surviving on their fat reserves. They wake up at the slightest disturbance, and if this happens too often, they'll use up their energy supplies and die before the return of spring. Dr Tattle and a colleague from the US Fish and Wildlife Service enter the cave only briefly. In different parts, it offers a range of temperatures from above 10 degrees centigrade to below freezing, making it suitable for an unusually wide variety of species. The body temperature of this big brown bat falls to match its surroundings. Its heartbeat slows dramatically and its blood barely moves through its veins. The probe shows that the bat is below freezing, but it's still alive. Nearby is one of the rarest bats in North America, an eastern big-eared bat. Throughout the cave, there are bats sleeping on the walls and ceiling. A little brown bat, its fur covered in condensation, clings to the wall. It spent every winter of its life in this cave. This species has been known to live for up to 32 years. The bats will now be left in peace to hibernate until the warmer weather of spring calls them back to the outside world. Without doubt, the biggest threat to bats throughout the world comes from humans. Cave-dwelling bats are especially vulnerable 
whether they're hibernating in a winter shelter like Hubbard's Cave or raising young in summer nurseries like Bracken Cave. Bat populations are declining alarmingly worldwide, sometimes as a result of unintentional disturbance of their caves and sometimes as the result of unfounded fear and deliberate killing. Bats have always had natural enemies, such as snakes. The bats wake up before dusk and circle at the cave entrance. All the snake has to do is hang over the entrance and wait for a wing to touch its mouth. Each snake may eat three or four bats in an evening, an insignificant toll on the millions of them passing by. A constant stream of bats pours out over the surrounding countryside. It may take hours for all of them to leave the cave. Before morning, they'll eat over 250 tons of insects. The first to go leave while it's still light. They face another natural hazard. Red-tailed hawks patrol above the cave entrance, picking off the bats as they emerge. Again, the effect they have on the population is negligible. The only real problem for bats is the human species. In the last few decades, we've come to understand that our survival depends on the fragile ecosystems in which we live. In the past 10 years, it's become clear that the survival of those ecosystems depends in no small part on bats. Long ago, bats filled the night skies almost everywhere on Earth. In 30 or 40 years, huge numbers of individuals and several whole species have been lost. Even so, it's not too late. As Merlin Tuttle's work has shown, last-minute acts of conservation can begin to restore bat populations. Their survival depends on human attitudes. Since our survival may depend on them, we would do well to do all we can to protect the secret world of bats. Thank you.